Hi, everybody. This is Fred with WP Shout, Fred Meyer, and I'm delighted to um, introduce Rosemary Tantrabensko, um, who's the woman you see on video next to me or above me, I'm not sure which. <laughs> and um, she's going to lead us through um, a practice that really she developed that um, called embodied writing that uses the body as kind of a um, an instrument and a sounding board and a tuning fork for, for creativity. So I'm just gonna say a little bit about, about Rosemary and then I'll uh, hand it over, Rosemary, to you. Um, so here's Rosemary's bio just real quick. With an MA in English from Florida State University and an MFA from the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop, Rosemary has taught writing for 17 years with universities and is a professional manuscript editor. Her four psychological suspense novels have garnered many awards, such as multiple gold medals, silver and bronze on large, large categories. And Encore, a contemporary love story of hypnotic abduction, was listed as one of the dozen best thrillers of the year by best thrillers, beating competitors Stephen King, John Grisham, and Dean Koontz. She's had, <laughs> nice, well done. Those guys have, you know, they've had plenty of, time in the limelight so right. Take that, yeah <laughs> she's had literary novellas and novelettes published and over 200 of her short stories in all major genres have appeared in magazines and anthologies chat books and collections she has released other people's work through a magazine and lucid play publishing and she maintains a popular resource site about experimental writing and she's um, a longtime writers.com instructor um, where she teaches embodied writing and short story writing and and other stuff as well. So Rosemary, thank you so much for joining us and um, making yourself available and please um, take it away. I, I can't wait to learn what you have to teach us about embodied writing. Thank you. And I love teaching with writers.com. It's just a wonderful honor to get to. So this class, the embodied writing class, there are the two sections uh, at this moment with writers.com and um, they're similar. One begins you off and gets you used to it, and then they build on each other. So it's a set of exercises that you learn one at a time, but then once you learn it, you can do it at any moment when you're working on your writing. And you can use it to help you just avoid being too sedentary. <clears throat> If you're writing all day long, that's not good for your health. So they recommend you get up every half hour or so. So I used to get up every half hour while I was writing and I would pace around, but it didn't feel incredibly productive. It felt like a little frustrating because I was stopping my writing time. And that's how I came up with these exercises to begin with. Ways that I could use movement incorporating with what I was thinking about with the stories and now I would never go back. When I'm just sitting there typing and it's static and I'm a brain and my arms and my hands are just like these lines that are there to deliver my thoughts onto the paper, I don't feel like I can move readers and I don't feel like, you know, if my readers are, they're coming in from the gym, and they're like, Ah, they're ready to go and they read you know really just like flimsy flabby prose they're not going to be very excited but if they're coming in from the gym and they're reading really tight powerful potent prose then they're going to be much more ready to join me with my with my words and some kinds of writing are going to need more oomph and sometimes you're going to want something a little more subtle. So the way that you move when you get up um, is going to affect how your writing comes out. So, so I want to first just take you through the basic concept of the relationship between your body and reading. Because when you're reading, you may think of it as all in your mind just a brain eye thing you're holding the book but that's it you're forgetting about your your body but in fact scientists have shown that our bodies change 
according to the protagonist in a book that we read and it stays like that for a while you know for weeks even if we just read a little bit of a novel it affects us our neurotransmitters are affected by what we read our hormones are pumping everything is an emotional bodily reaction and that's because writers if they know what they're doing they're manipulating the audience for that exact reason so imagine you know your favorite writer just has a new book out you've got it in front of you suddenly and you're really excited what does that excitement feel like depending on the writer and the genre and the mood of the piece you're going to have <clears throat> a different type of excitement so just picture that for a minute and tune into your body Picture your favorite author who has a new book out and you've got it in your hands. You're looking at the book description, looking at the cover. And what does your body feel? You can try to describe it in words, but that doesn't really do it justice. But try to describe it through movement. How, what does that excitement feel like? It's like, yes, my favorite occult alien detective is going to show me the way again i know i can count on him or you know is it that this this beautiful literary piece is going to keep me thrilled sentence by sentence and i'm just going to be so glad to be a human you know what are you feeling and so i want to give an example of how an author manipulates your emotions because very often people try to write a thriller, for example, and they just say, well, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. And that's not the way it's done at all. And if you involve your body, then it can help remind you that that's not the way, and it can help ease you into manipulating your own emotions and the character's emotions and the reader's emotions. So this book is Killing Floor. Uh, it started off Lee Child's extremely popular Jack Reacher series. So it seems like a good one. It's universally loved as an example. So it starts out, this guy is, is just at a diner and he's eating and he's drinking. He's really tired. He just walked in the rain for 14 miles. And then the police come in and they arrest him for murder. So it starts off with him at this diner. You know, it's already weird. Like we don't know why he's just walked all this way and why he's so tired of what he's doing there. But it's very familiar. It shows you what does the diner look like. This, it's very heavily detailed with all the senses. And when you do these exercises, you will also be motivated to use all the senses. Because when you take breaks, and just move around, you can engage your senses again. So you're not just thinking in abstract terms. So he describes the diner and, and what the police are doing and he's assessing them. And that's kind of an interesting reaction. You know, we don't know who this character is yet. And he even tests them and he will not respond. He will not lie down on the floor. So how does that feel? Take a minute to imagine being in a diner and the police come in to arrest you for murder, which you did not commit. Do you feel flummoxed? Do you feel discombobulated and unempowered and, you know, afraid? What, what do you feel like? And how does that manifest in your body? Does it make you shaky? Does it make you weak? Does it make you get kind of dizzy and have a hard time standing up? What do you feel? Now just exaggerate that. Express that, what you're feeling, in an exaggerated way. That's basically the, the idea of the class. That you exaggeratedly express your bodily emotions. Bodily emotions. That's not a common phrase, but all emotions are going to affect your body. If you're stressed, you're, you start eating, cannibalizing the muscles. If you don't sleep enough, you start cannibalizing the muscles. You know, your, your muscles become harder to hold up. 
there's a strong correlation between how you feel and your body. So he describes the gravel heating up, the sunshine. He uses all the senses. And that helps you be there with him so that you are, you're sort of Jack Reacher and that you feel vulnerable and discombobulated, but you're sort of like looking at Jack, Jack, Reacher, Jack Reacher like he's your, your buddy, you know, he's your friend. And you're assessing like, is this a character I want to spend a lot of time with? Well, you probably do because this character knows what he's doing in a scary situation. And it's like, you might want to marry him. You might want to hire him and just be his right-hand man. You might want to do something so that you're safe. So this book, it first puts you in this feeling of fear. So express the fear. And then it puts you in this sense of, well, this guy knows what he's doing. Maybe I could be like that. If I'm in a situation that would normally be fearful. Maybe I could be like him. And subconsciously, we know that we change, our bodies change to become like the protagonist. So it's a way of telling us, like, yes, we can be strong. We can be like, we can be like Jack. We can tell him, yeah, I'm not going to lie down. So what does that feel like? The mixed feelings of fear and confidence and respect and admiration and fear for him. Act out that multiplicity. And so then he says that he never killed anybody, not in that town and not for a long time. And that's the end of the chapter. So that leaves us with questions. This is completely different from starting with expository backstory and saying, yeah, this happened to me in the past. And then you get started with the story. That's never the best way to do it if you have an option of starting with the action. Because think if you... If you're reading just the backstory, are there any emotions getting generated? Does your body feel any excitement? No, you're just being told the backstory in preparation. How does that feel if you're being just told the backstory? It's kind of like a dull thud in your body, right? But jumping into the action, it's like, all right, take me, I'm ready to go. So I stood there and Baker ferreted into every pocket. So that's an example of what I mean when I say muscular prose. Ferreted was probably not the first word that Lee Childs thought of. Probably took a lot of time figuring out, well, what's the best word? Ferreted. Like that, we can picture a ferret moving. We can hear it in our minds. We can smell it even. You know, it's like his hand was reaching his pocket, similar to a ferret. And so he... he he meets this guy who's obviously the antagonist, who is calling him terrible names, giving false witness, telling him he's going to do, he's going to get him killed, you know, as a, as a murderer, and then he's going to spit on his grave. And so what does that make you feel like? You just bonded with this character. So that's like somebody doing that to you or doing it to your best friend. You want to just like punch back, right? You want to take down Morrison, the, the antagonist. Like, that's not okay. Feel that anger in your body. Act it out a little bit. What does it feel like to your body? How can you express that like an actor would? And so those kinds of feelings that you can generate, concern for the character, you really want to be on his side against this other guy. He's in trouble. You're on his side against this other guy against him like that brings out this bodily desire to punch somebody or kick somebody or something and then he says he he refuses a liar like this guy is really audacious why is he like that he doesn't have an address or id or driver's license or phone he can't really say where he's from very well that brings up a lot of questions and this guy keeps trying to get him to answer it so instead of just saying here he was, Jack Reacher, he didn't have any of these things because he's an ex-military policeman. No, you wait until the reveal is built up by the audience's body going, give it to me, tell me what the answer is. I want to know. I want to solve this mystery. Why does he not know where he is? Experience that wanting to know. What does that feel like? Act that out.
wanting to know the answers instead of just being given an info dump from the first opportunity. And we can identify in a primal level, I think, with somebody who does not have all these civilized networking opportunities engaged, you know, he's just living in a really natural, childlike, primal way. Like we've all been there, at least as a child, you know, that, that's, that gets us down deep. Like, what it would be like to be without all that stuff and then be caught and people don't know why, why you are, are like that. And so then, then he says he's afraid and he feels like he was worried, you know, he feels like he's in Alice in Wonderland. And so for him to admit that, it's like he's letting us in on his secret. He's got this tough experience of, you know, being exteriorly self-confident, but we're his confidant and we see him afraid and we're afraid for him. And we therefore are set up for this whole book by this beginning. So hopefully I've eased you in a little bit to what it's like, the idea of bodily reaction and expressing that so are there any questions at this point before we go into a little bit more of an exercise if you have any questions um just put them in the q a section or the chat q a is better but chat's fine and i'll um i'll read them out as they come in i'll, I'll give it about 30 seconds and then we'll move forward Blake says, ready for exercises. All right. Okay, let's do so, it. So in this book, you know, you've created this sense of being precarious. And, and it's like, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going on. We hope this guy can save us. We hope this guy can be okay. And at the same time, a sense of hope that, yeah, he's going to save us. So we want to reach the end of this precariousness by the end of the book and have everything work out. He's victorious. So that creates the flow of the whole narrative. Precarious, gotta fix this problem. So think about something that you have written, are writing, have imagined writing. And if you can't think of anything, that's okay. This, this is a really simple, easy exercise that can just be done theoretically. So think about Think about a narrative. So now keep that in mind. And I've used this technique a lot of times when I didn't even know if it was going to be a tragedy or have an upbeat ending. You know, you could be writing something like a gothic novel and you don't know if it's going to be a gothic romance or a gothic tragedy. You know, it could be literary. It can be, that can be a, a tragedy very easily. Most genre, unless it's neo noir or some horror, is going to have an upbeat ending. But if you're writing something that can go either way, you may not know at the beginning. And to just try to figure it out cerebrally, it's limited. So I've, I've used this before many times to figure out, you know, what do my characters want to say? Do my characters want to have a tragedy? So it's, you know, they're, they're doing pretty good at first. Maybe they're a little privileged. Maybe they are just got some moral iffiness. And then they do this mistaken thing that takes them way up to the top. And they're up at the top and like, yes, I can see forever. This is my future. I'm going to be doing great now. And that is their false illusion of success, and it's going to be all downhill from there. And that could be what you want to express. And if it is, just feel it out. Like, imagine your story being a tragedy. Imagine it as you move around and you're like, you're, you're, 
you're you're acting out the the false elation you're acting out the tragedy does that feel right to you does that feel like it gets across the message and the theme that you want or maybe it's something entirely different whatever it is you can you can use that same concept of expressing in an exaggerated way it's through space and time so walk as you walk forward that's like time unfolding in your in your story and just try that now picture this and maybe you already know how it if it's a tragedy or not but just act out like the overall arc go up and then go down just go down and then go up what does it do and so just act out take a minute and act out this narrative that you have in mind it could be a short story it could be a novel whatever it is now think about the character arc of the protagonist you know, a lot of times you can forget that the whole character arc is central to many types of fiction. You can forget that there's got to be this onslaught of obstacles from the antagonist. You know, what does it feel like to your character to have these onslaughts? As, as your character is going forward, if there are no onslaughts that your character is fighting against, tooth and nail, high stakes, could end up terrible, could end up great, then you've just identified the problem in your novel. All you have to do is just act it out. Like, what are the ons what do the onslaughts feel like to that protagonist? So act out your your protagonist being slammed by whatever the antagonist is throwing at him or her or right now. Picture the overall journey of that character. Is it like a hero's journey? So the character is okay at first and then goes through this, is, is given this inciting incident and then is given this opportunity to act on it. You may decide not to be really hesitant. You know, what does that hesitancy feel like? Express that hesitancy. Be like an actor or a interpretive dance dancer and then he decides to take the plunge he's going to do it he's going to go into that new world and bring back something for the community what does that decisiveness feel like to that character act out that kind of motion how is that different from the hesitancy and note how the character moves in the two different times because they're going to move like you are if you're feeling hesitant you're going to be kind of scrunched in you're going to like not have much blood circulating in your face you might start feeling a little cold like you need to just take a little rest but if you're at the moment of deciding in the first plot point you're going to go for it what does that feel like your heart's beating faster, your breath is coming faster, your vision is more acute. Um, your muscles are ready to go. They've got adrenaline pumping. And what does that feel like? Maybe the character is more bouncy, maybe the character is taking a stand with wide, wide apart feet and just ready to go do anything. You think about then, you know, the character is going to be making all these mistakes of course that's what makes it a narrative doing things wrong because he doesn't really know how to do things right yet and there's a flaw or just a lack of understanding about the antagonist that's going to prevent him from solving it and ending the novel or story right away 
So what does it feel like for this character to have this confusion, this bewildering inability to get there? Think of think of a scene in that in that part if you have one in mind, and just take a little time now and express that. Express a different mixed part of, of it. Because if you write a character with just one feeling and one way of moving, it's not going to be nearly as interesting as if there are multi sides to it. So act out that moment for a little while. And what about the midpoint? Suddenly the character has seen something completely new. Everything is not what he thought it was. And he's going to have to rethink it all and get more proactive than ever. So if you're writing and you, you know that you're supposed to do that, you know, you can write that in. But if you act it out first, you're really going to inhabit that. So if you're acting that out right now, what kind of, what does your vision look like? Do you notice certain things that you wouldn't have noticed in the hesitant or the complacent phase? Are you more keen or are you less keen with your visual acuity? Or does it, how does your voice change? Make, make some sound as the midpoint the new revelations and the new renewed proactivity. And then you have the crisis, everything just, it's terrible, really terrible. It's like just, it's not gonna work. Goals are not gonna be met. Your character is just going through it the deepest, darkest time. What does that feel like? How can you describe that with your body? If you were acting this out as a, as a dance without any music, how would you let the audience know he's going into the crisis? You know, it doesn't have to be what he's actually doing in the book. But how can you express that? And by, by feeling that, you're going to be calling on your own vulnerability. So if he is experiencing the dark night of the soul and you get on the floor in the corner and you curl up and you close your eyes and you rock, you're going to get in touch with the dark night of your own soul. You're going to be able to describe that much more full bodied and then you've got the, the climax, yay, the, the battle scene where he takes on the antagonist and that can be really harrowing. But by the end, it's, it's like this great victory, right? Unless you're writing a tragedy. So picture that scene in your, your narrative or your imaginary narrative and Act that out right now. Really get into it. Act out the oomph, the panache, the bravery. Being this new person who has gone through and learned all these lessons, you are going to move differently than you did at first. You're going to move completely differently. How are you moving? How is the character moving? And how are your readers moving when they read it? Because they're going to walk away like, yeah, we did it. We, got, we took down those bad guys. Yeah, we can do anything. We can, we can, doesn't matter what you throw at us, we can fix it. So act that out. So this is something you can do scene by scene. You know, these are just major plot points, but when you write one little scene, you can act out that whole scene. It has the same progression. There's a character with a goal. The goal has obstacles. 
doesn't obtain what he's trying to obtain. It's a disaster. He rethinks it. He has a dilemma and he decides to move on. That's a very common theme in uh, scene. So if you have a story in mind, see if you can see if you can think of a theme. Scene, I mean. And you want this to be not just dull on the page. You want to affect your reader's emotions. You want to affect the reader's hormones, neurotransmitters. How can you manipulate the reader by the way the prose is written? If this prose starts off gently and then suddenly has a drastic turnaround when you're writing this scene you can get up during the, the slow gentle seemingly placid part you can move like that just move really delicately with nuances like a like a ballet dancer and then you go write that part of the scene and then when you get to the sudden turnaround you can come out and you're just leaping about and you're just, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you are, you know, in a completely different space. And then you finish writing the scene and the language will come out differently. The language after you do the gentle nuances, it's going to be, you know, crystalline and fragile and beautiful. And then the language when you, when you're, you've just been leaping about in this sudden reversal, that language is going to have shorter sentences, shorter words, more powerful cadence. So the last syllabus, last syllable in the sentence is going to be really bam. It's going to have a lot of emphasis. Whereas in the first part, the last syllable might just be trailing off gently. But in this part, it's going to have emphasis. And you're going to be able to do that naturally because you've just been stomping. And if you're stomping, you're going to write something with strong emphasis at the end of the sentence. So, so picture that now and act out a scene again, beginning, middle, or end of the scene. Show, act out the changes in a scene. And I'll give you a little bit of time. And you can do the same thing with a sentence, scene, overall story, overall plot arc, and with the characters and with the reader. One way I like to imagine the reader's journey is as if I'm a symphony conductor and I'm directing, you know? You know, at first it might be just very gentle, just coming in. We're starting to see the, the location and the scenery. And then, ba -da 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 -da. so you imagine that you're a symphony conductor and you're directing the flow of the reader's emotions throughout your narrative. So, of course, you don't have to do it correctly the way a symphony conductor would do it. But just imagine you're directing the emotions of the reader, you're going to feel, phew, you're going to now feel, ah. And so try that now. Direct the emotions as if it's a symphony because it's not just one thing happen to another. It's a symphony of emotions that, that get really intense and gentle again and then really intense and gentle again because if it's always the same, that's going to be boring. So that's one thing you'll find out if you do this is if you act out every scene and every scene is the same level of intensity, then you know that you need to put in more ups and downs. So go for the directing for a bit.
So that's, that's one exercise, basically, out of the whole range of exercises. Each one does a different thing. And if you only do just this one, and you never learn the other ones, you can really apply this well to your writing, and I think it will end up being stronger. My students that I show this to, they're, writer, they're writers who have been doing this for a while, maybe, and their, their prose is a little bit um, flaccid at first, maybe. But once they do these exercises, wow, it's just the best writing ever. I'm just blown away by the brilliance because they, they get rid of all the little glue words, you know, the little extra the little words that you, you kind of think you need, but you really don't if you take time to cut them out. And so it's more, more potent with the words. They use stronger verbs. They use more um, senses. And everything about it is just more affecting. Sentence by sentence, word by word. And it's just really exciting to read it. And so that's the goal of these exercises is to be able to not only generate ideas and figure out how you want the plot, but to make your prose itself be really powerful. So last year exercise. And so if you have any questions now to ask me, uh, this would be a time to put them in the chat. Thank you so much. So um, the Q&A is open and the chat is open as well. Um, while I, okay, Karen asks, how about poetry? Yeah, definitely. Poetry. Um, I think of poetry and, and fiction as being very similar. I studied poetry for a long time before I jumped into fiction. And I feel like studying poetry was very helpful for me as a fiction writer. So I think of them, when I say fiction, I really kind of mean poetry too. You know, they're on a continuum in my mind. Um, so poetry, you really want your language to be very powerful. You know, if you're writing a generic thriller that you're going to finish in two months and put it up with your other ones. The language may be somewhat dampened down and, and ordinary. You know, they say it can be best to have it for a seventh or eighth grade reading level. But if you're writing poetry, you really have a great chance to work with this exercise because you want your language to be elevated. You do not want your language to be generic, direct, Simple, just simple, straightforward, on the nose, saying stuff generally is not the best for poetry. So you want to be able to affect what your readers are feeling. What kind of mood are they feeling that goes beyond language? So rather than just saying something directly, like you could get away with maybe in, in a novel, you want to be indirectly creating that feeling in your reader. So if you create that feeling in yourself as you act out what it is that you want to express in this poem, or what the, maybe the, if it's a narrative poem, what's the character feeling, and act out what, you, what the reader's feeling. Put yourself in the reader. Imagine yourself being the reader. What do you feel ideally from this poem? And then look at the poem that you've written, put yourself in the reader's mind, and then act it out again. Did it deliver? Do you have the feeling that you were going for? And if not, jump back into that movement again and see if you can rev up, like, what's the difference? Am I not getting my heart rate, in, rate enough up and, and engaged, you know? I was like, is the reader just kind of, okay. Well, get your own heart rate up and see what does that. What, what, what language, what image can create that, that heart rate to go up? And then you know you've got something for for the reader. Thank you, Rosemary. Jennifer says, I like this idea. It makes sense to me to get up and move around to role play and physically put myself in the situation of my characters. No questions, just wanted to say that I find this helpful. Thank you, it's great to hear that. <laughs> uh, Blake says, 
I couldn't find an action narrative for my body until you suggested conducting a symphony. Thank you. What other movement acting directions can you suggest? Well, um, if you watch, say, uh, modern dance, that's a good thing, you know, watch that first. And so then you can get in mind of being a dancer. So picture yourself on the stage and there's nothing else but you, the spotlights on you, the audience is waiting to hear the story, to see the story. And there's not even any music. You have to create the music with your body. They're going to hear the music in their mind in this sort of ephemeral way. And so if you picture yourself, maybe start in the, start in the middle of your floor, curling up, and then start acting it out for this audience, um, then I found that that works really well. Blake follows up. He says, get my heart rate up. How about doing some jumping jacks? <laughs> you can do that for sure. That's one thing I like to do. If I'm going to write something that's just got lots of energy, I will do jumping jacks before I write it. Um, that gets my heart rate up. But on the other hand, if you're, if you're doing jumping jacks, that's good. That's a great way to do it. Do jumping jacks and then you can write something with, it with a fast heart rate. And then if you're writing something with a slow, even keeled experience, then you don't do jumping jacks at that time. But you can go a step beyond that and think, well, like, hey, jumping jacks could be in a way kind of cheating. So how can you get the heart rate up through emotions? You know, if you have you ever read something so beautiful, so poignant, just this image that you just that haunted you, it's like, wow, what an amazing thing for this writer to have said. Like that gets your heart rate up a little bit. And so if you if you you can do it with, with jumping jacks, absolutely, but you can also try doing it with the language itself. I guess the question for me is, um, yeah, it feels very much like it's a lot about the movement of energy in the body. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I'm just, I'm sort of curious why I think it, it only came up recently in my life that in fact emotions have this quality of being energy moving through the body. And I certainly never really wrote like that. It's like I wanted myself to feel, you know, a certain way when I was writing and I, I wanted the reader to feel a certain way, but it never occurred to me at that kind of like body level or literal level. I guess it's just, it's almost like news I never got until recently. I, I'm not quite sure what the question is here, but it's, it's just weird to not realize that. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have anything to, if that makes you, what you think about that. Well, one part of energy moving through the body is that to, for flow, we need to have no lymph constriction. And when we're typing like this for a long time, we're going to have lymph restriction. There's just no way around it. And so it's like thoughts travel through our arms and, and into our hands. I mean, if I'm going to put in my, my password, I have no idea what it is. I have to type it. You know, there's an intelligence in the arms and the hands. They, and if I'm going to try to dictate, I cannot write a story. I have to use my arms. My arms, the flow of energy through my arms, it's a habit, but it's also just, it's, it's incorporating my full body in a way that if there's a lymph stuck there, the energy is going to get stuck there. And so if you can do these exercises, that get the lymph moving, the energy will also flow. And some people like to do things like um, touch for health or acupressure, acupuncture, things like that to get energy moving through your body. So if you're feeling a writer's block, you might want to try one of these um, alternative um, medical methods of lymph massage or something like that to get 
to get the energy flowing and you might be able to write better that way. Thank you. So I'll leave the Q&A open for a little, oh, here we go. One more from Blake. And uh, um, if you do have another uh, question that you'd like to post, uh, please do it now, because I'm going to leave the Q&A open for a few seconds after, after Blake's question, but I, I'm going to shut it down here pretty quick. Blake says, I sometimes get my emotion going by reading an author with whom I identify. For example, Tropic of Cancer. If the imagination is failing to reach me at an emotional level, I'll go to familiar text. I assume you'd support that idea, but now I'm wondering if in so doing, I'm not building the ability to get excited with thought. That's similar to the jumping jacks idea, right? It's, it's very useful to do that. Um, I've done that before writing poems. I would, I would look at Octavio Paz's poetry and that would inspire me to, to write my own. But it is kind of cheating um, if you really want to be a purist about it because you're depending on somebody else's writing and the reader has not just been reading that. The reader has to depend entirely on what you're writing. And so you have to create something that is moving to them. And a lot of times it can just be the cadence. You don't, it doesn't even matter what you're saying that much. But if your language has this musicality of it, um, that, you know, it can be syncopated, it can be flowing, it can be convoluted, uh, dance-like, whatever it is, the, the, the cadence, the rhythm of the words really affects people's emotions. And so it can help to read somebody else's writing and notice what they're doing with the cadence. And then you start using that kind of cadence as well in your own. Um, so it can be a, it can be a, a good crutch, uh, but using your body to get to that point um, can be handier. You know, you can do it everywhere. You don't have to have uh, somebody's, somebody's book there. Thanks for that. I, I hope I'm going to pronounce your name right. Tara or Tara asks, I think it's probably Tara, <laughs> like Teresa probably, asks, do you base your character, like Terry, okay, Terry. Terry asks, thank you. Do you base your character's experiences on personal experiences to be able to feel and express them better? Um, I think I know what you mean in terms of like things that I have experiences, like actual events in my life. Do I base my characters on that? Um, I used to at first, almost always, um, because I had an extremely adventuresome, unusual life. I've really done a lot of things that most people would never imagine doing. And I wanted to describe these things to people and give them a glimpse into this world. Like these kinds of things, you can, you can live out in nature and live with animals, you know, and I would try to write about that. But the thing is, if you're living out in nature with animals, there's, at least in my case, there was no conflict. And, you know, the things that happened to me did not occur in a plot. Um, so they could be, they could be good for vignettes and anecdotes, but they weren't necessarily that great um, for writing a fully plotted story because if something happens, you don't necessarily want to change what happened to make it fit a plot. Um, so now it's been a long time since I've written anything that's really directly um, related to my life, but I like, there was a period where I was, I was living in rural Alabama and taking care of my father who was hallucinating and, and blind and bed bound. And I was not getting any sleep with all this going on. And so I figured, well, I want to write about this in a way, but not directly. So I, I would imagine that I was just dreaming onto the page. And so I would write these sort of kaleidoscopic views of what was going on. These like dreamlike versions that reflected on this central thing that was really happening. So that that's kind of more how I might approach it in kind of an oblique way. I hope that answered your question. Hope I interpreted it correctly. 
Thank you. Terry, if you want to ask a follow up. Okay, she says, yeah, thank you. Okay, one more from Blake. Again, going with the scenario of not connecting with the emotion, how about actually playing some music and dancing? I love to dance and I love to play music. And that is actually what happened to my last novel because I did that, like when I was writing it, when I did, even without getting it up, I'd be listening to Neo Psych Rock the whole time. And it was helping me get in touch with the passion of these characters. You know, it's a romance novel. There's a lot of longing. And so by listening to that music, that would help me get into that state. And then when I would get up, I would dance to it. Uh, and so then that transformed it. So the music, the characters became musicians. And I, I re referenced 108 songs throughout. And ultimately, they're, they got together, played a band, and saved the town through you know, psych rock music. So there is that danger <laughs> that you may not want to have it be about music, but it's going to take over your world. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll put on the same song that just really gets me jumping, and I'll listen to it 30 times and just like, leap about, and I'm just like, covered in sweat. And then I'll write a powerful action scene. Um, so it's kind of similar to reading another book. You know, it is, you could consider it um, cheating, but when you're reading another book, it's just your brain. When you're dancing, like you're really getting involved. It's coming from you and you're gonna be able to use your, use your body to write well. Thank you. I guess I'll ask one more question um, and maybe, maybe we'll close here. Um, I'm curious how you think about, you know, the writing that's in you. So maybe your characters or the scenes that, that you write or the, the stories that you tell. To what extent do you find that those live in your body? And to what extent do they live in your mind? And is it kind of both? And do they live elsewhere in addition to those two places? How, how does that work for you? That's a really interesting question. I really like that. Um, I don't make much distinction between my mind and my body normally, um, but unless I'm just like typing in a very robotic way, in that case, I can't combine the two very well. But as long as I'm moving fluidly, then they function as one thing. So the characters continue to live on, partly whenever I would hear these songs that I listened to while writing it, um, I would, I would, I would really miss my characters and and kind of wish I had their life, and that I was like them, you know. And and uh, um, there's a certain aching, longing desire that's in this this music and these this this last book and the and the characters, and so I can only reread my books or listen to that music at certain times I have to ration it because it's, it lives in there so much that it's like, Oh, I don't want to feel longing right now. I just want to be happy. <laughs> and so even though the ending of the story is an upbeat ending, I'm a little stuck in the longing part because that type of music is stuck in the longing. That's a, that's a problem. If you listen to music of a certain genre where say neo psych rock it's it i feel like these writers they have you know their parents never picked them up enough when they were a kid or something you know they're they're sort of stuck in that and so if you if 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 i'm feeling sort of stuck in that then it's like i have to not think about my book and think about a different book where um i'm not i'm not in that longing and uh, and then i feel fine <laughs> Mm. Well, thank you for that. So it's almost like they, 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 they really inhabit your, I guess, your body and mind together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even the ones that uh, have not been published yet, I decided to take a, I was thinking maybe I just won't put them out. You know, I'll just, I'll just hang on to them. And that was so hard. It really felt like, I mean, not to be, you know, uh, irreverent, but it, it felt like having a child that needed to be born and I was not letting it be, be born because all these characters were 
so real to me and where they lived and it's like they're extensions of me they're they're parts of me so to not do anything with them it felt like my body was impacted and so now I'm going ahead and I'm working with them again and I'm going to you know release them and it's like uh, the way that I move is more fluid I'm not holding these characters inside and just like suppressing them anymore mm. okay maybe it would uh, one more from Blake and then I'll, 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 I'll do a little bit of wrap up Blake says the story I'm writing involves a hallucination that goes through a variety of dream shifts so I appreciate what you've just shared. With the start of the exercise tonight, I couldn't connect with the character's hallucination. Mm. So did you connect with the character's hallucination better after going through the exercise? I'm assuming he's typing. <laughs> Blake says, uh, I think, like, yes, thanks to the conductor suggestion. I think that really right. I'm so glad. Yeah, the conductor is one of my very favorite ones. Probably of all the ones I do, it's the one I do most. Hmm. Well, Rosemary, thank you so much. Let me see if I can turn my video back on. Uh, nope, I cannot. So I'm going to be a disembodied voice here. But Rosemary, I just want to say thank you so much. I think this is so fantastic and um, to me, so innovative. And I, I just so appreciate you sharing it with us. And um, I guess I really I'll just- appreciate the questions yeah. too. Oh yeah, I, and thank you everybody for, for joining in and for the, for the really wonderful questions. And I'll just say, Rosemary, at, at the moment, um, uh, your upcoming classes are our first time ever offering um, Introduction to Writing Genre Fiction, and that's on October 21st. Um, would you like to say anything about that course? Because that's the, that's the first time we're on, uh, really offering a, a course like this. I am so excited about that class. I think it's, it's just not taught enough. You know, so many writing programs stick with literary MFA programs and things like that. Um, but genre writing, you know, if you open up to that, like you just have so many other opportunities, even if you're writing literary, knowing that, knowing that like there's a certain mystery very simple mystery format um, and you you can plug that into your literary story and it may not be truly genre but it has that model and that strengthens it it gives you you know a skeleton to to mold the story on um, and if you write strict genre then you know you know the model and you can you can do it and you can make money ideally <laughs> and and um so yeah i put a huge huge amount of time into this class just a gargantuan project but i just want to make it really as rewarding for everybody as possible so it goes through first it starts out with basically how do you write fiction and what is genre and what's it like to write genre and and you know the first, there's like a whole class just in the first week of just reading, you know, you don't have to do a whole class worth of, of um, exercises, but um, then it goes genre by genre. So it has, you know, thrillers and romance and suspense and etc. And it also includes one with literary. It is a genre. It's not genre with a capital G. So that way you can see the differences between the two and each genre it has hybrids it has sub genres it has related genres so people taking the class can write in any of those you know they they don't have to write horror they can write weird or new weird or slipstream um neo-noir instead of mystery you know so there's so many different directions you can go in that uh, I think it's just going to be really, really good for people. So I can't wait to, to teach it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see how, how it is for folks. And then um, most directly kind of a continuation of, of what you taught us tonight. Um, on November 11th, you have embodied writing, improve your writing with full body creativity. Is there anything you'd like to say about that course uh, before we close? Um, no, really, I think I probably kind of covered it. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it, it's uh, in some sense a continuation of, of what we started to learn tonight. I yeah, think. So, um, so it's a six weeks course. And so like this one, it kind of eases you into it where you're at first you're you're thinking about, you know, what is it that you respond to bodily about your reading? And, you know, how can you do that um, with your own writing? So it's like this where it just kind of slowly gets you moving and expressing and exaggerating. And then it, it moves through all the different things like you're, you're using your voice and you're using your, your non-dominant hand to do some handwriting. You're, you know, doing these different acting out the characters. Um, and so it has video and audio and text. Um, where you can access my my lectures and then you do these exercises and then you write something so each week you'll have something that you've written some sort of fiction and um so you can you can take like a like i i've written books that i've written in basically almost every genre trying to figure out which which genre i really wanted partly because i'd be following the trend like oh dystopians out okay i gotta change it into sci-fi well sci-fi people are not going to really like it if it's got these these kind of fantastical elements so i've got to change it into you know supernatural and you know so i just like have written the same book into many genres. And so you may have something like that where you have a book and you're not sure which genre it should be, which one you want to focus on, which, you know, if it's okay to have some hybridization in there. Um, you may want to write the, the same book, you know, outline or sketch or scene or something as different genres. Um, or you can come into it with nothing in mind at all. There's a prompt, an elaborate prompt that I get for each one. So you can just write the prompt or you can just do a log line like you would for a movie, just, you know, a sentence or two. There are many options. So you don't have to feel worried about anything with this class. You know, nobody's going to see you moving around. Um, but it's great if you describe the process, you know, what was it like to move around? How did that affect what you wrote? Rosemary, thank and it you works so much. well for people who are disabled as well. You know, if you can just move a little bit, that's really all you need to do. Well, thank you so much for this. And um, yeah, it's just so enriching. And I, I, I really thank you. Is, is there anything you'd like to, to say as we close? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you so much to um, the attendees for, for your attention and your wonderful questions. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you.